Hello, everyone. Uh, really delighted to welcome you all to this uh, launch on talk, and even more delighted in many ways to um, welcome actually a Swiss compatriot of mine, Professor Christoph Graber. I should say, though, that we've never met in Switzerland before. I followed uh, his great scholarly work, um, but it took a while to get him to Cambridge and finally being able to meet uh, and, and talk uh, about interesting topics. So Christoph is a professor at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He has a chair for legal sociology, as you can see here, uh, with a focus on media law. Uh, he's doing really interesting work. Uh, today we'll hear about a book project and about the paper he's working on, uh, dealing with a really fascinating question, and that is, uh, how do core values and, and even rights emerge? It's really, I think, multidisciplinary, fascinating question, uh, and how also do such uh, rights ultimately make it into law or into constitutions? So Christoph will talk today about this concept of bottom-up constitutionalism. Uh, we'll uh, bring together different perspectives from different disciplines, and I'm already uh, looking forward uh, to a great conversation thereafter. Uh, Christoph, uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, we actually even made it snow today so that you feel at home and particularly welcome here in Cambridge. And we're uh, really delighted to have you here. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a fascinating topic. Um, and I'm particularly looking forward to uh, also bringing different theories together, also bridging the Atlantic uh, in, in many respects, as you, as you will see some of the concepts that uh, Professor Graber will introduce today are coming actually from from German scholars of sociology that have been very influential uh, around the globe, and to bring it um, and use it um, uh, to illustrate some of the net neutrality debates in the U.S., uh, I think is a fun uh, way, also um, an intellectual uh, fun way uh, to deal with a uh, timely topic. So thank you, Christoph. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much, Urs, for this very warm introduction. Um, I'm really grateful and honored to be able to be here for the next uh, four months here at Harvard Law School and Berkman Klein Center to undertake um, a research project. And it is that research project that I would like to talk about today. Um, Urs already mentioned it um, briefly. What I'm interested in is the question, basically, whether we can observe the emergence empirically of a new constitutional right that is protecting the internet. So what I have in mind is not only a right that is protecting individual communications over the internet. What I have in mind is beyond that, a right that protects the internet as an institution. So um, for lack of a better word, in uh, my talk today and also in the written version of the paper that you may have seen, I use um, net neutrality. Net neutrality um, should be understood um, not as a very clear concept at the moment, as far as I use it. It stands as a kind of shortcut formula for a set of normative expectations that have not yet fully been conceptualized. So I would like to invite you to look at these two questions. These are the questions underlying uh, my talk today and in a way also underlying my uh, entire research project. So the first question is the one that I already um, um, outlined. It is, can you observe a new constitutional right that is protecting um, the internet? Can you observe an, an emergence of that new constitutional right? And then the second question, which is more uh, at the center of today's um, discussion, can such a constitutionalization process emanate from 
civil society. So not uh, from the processes that jurists know that are prescribed for constitutional um, amendment, but emanate from the middle of society. I'm asking these questions in my capacity as a legal sociologist, so I try to um, combine perspectives of a jurist, I'm a trained lawyer, perspectives of a jurist with uh, the perspective of social theory. And that can be tricky at times. You um, will see that already um, when I use the term constitution. I use this term in a very broad way. And at least um, for jurists, and I think especially in the United States, this uh, broad use can be rather provocative. So let me start with um, some um, introduction regarding the use of the concept of constitution, both in legal doctrine and in social theory. Now, when we talk about constitution, what do we understand in everyday language? We understand in everyday language, and also I think it, this is the understanding of jurists and of political philosophers, we understand something that refers to a written document, the US Constitution or the Swiss Constitution. So this is a formal understanding of constitution. This is the first way to understand constitution. Now, beyond that, uh, this understanding is usually focusing um, on a nation state, a nation state, and a na national territory. So beyond that understanding, we find uh, also um, legal theorizing that uh, deals with uh, the term constitution also beyond national territories. Uh, we see that, for instance, in international law or in the law of the European Union. In international law, for example, um, the Charter of the United Nations has uh, sometimes been um, called a constitution of the world. And in the European Union, the Charter of uh, Fundamental Freedoms um, has uh, also been um, compared with a constitution of the European um, Union. So this is, again, a formal um, approach, looking at a written document, but it is going beyond the national territory, looking at international context and looking at supranational European law. Now, beyond this formal um, way to look at constitution, there are also um, functional ways, sociological ways to look at the concept of um, constitution. Based on important theor theory um, of uh, Niklas Luhmann, the famous um, German uh, uh, sociologist that uh, Urs uh, referred to, and the uh, British uh, sociologist uh, Chris Thornhill, this functional perspective on constitution has been um, applied to look at constitutions still in the political legal realm. And this functional perspective um, identifies two specific functions that in a general way um, are argued to be present in any type of constitution that one can look at. And these elements are first a constitutive element and secondly a limitative element. Now to become a little bit more concrete, what would that mean? If we look at the Swiss constitution, there we find um, chapters um, organizing um, the powers of the Swiss state and that would be the constitutive aspect of the Swiss constitution. The limitative elements you find in those chapters of the Swiss constitution which deal with fundamental freedom, so limit the power of the state, and also in those chapters which deal with checks and balances or the division and separation of uh, the powers. 
so this is this understanding that this is functional, but looking still at the political uh, legal um, context. So now my understanding of constitution is even broader, and it is based on um, theorizing that has been um, undertaken by Niklas Luhmann. Again, he was the forerunner also for this broader view. And then, very importantly, David Shirley, an American um, sociologist, and Gunther Teubner, a German um, legal sociologist. So Gunther Teubner um, has um, um, introduced the term transnas transnational constitution or transnational constitutionalization. Other words, synonyms that he has used is societal constitutionalism or civil constitutionalism. What does he have in mind with his theory? He is uh, actually also um, putting forward uh, a functional theory and he um, invites us to expand these uh, functions to um, areas that are um, going beyond the political legal realm. So basing on Niklas Luhmann's theory that we are in a world society where we have uh, observed a move from a territorial differentiation to a functional differentiation, we are in a world where there are function systems like um, beyond the law and politics, we have the economy, we have science, we have religion, we have education, we have health. These are some of the main function systems and these, most of these function systems, they expand globally. And now the thesis of Teubner is uh, based on Schurli and Luhmann that um, also these function systems, not only politics and the law, but also other function systems develop their own constitutions. And he observes that by distinguishing these constitutive and limitative functions. Now, I would like um, very, very briefly to introduce the key stages of Teubner's theory of uh, societal constitutionalism or transnational constitutionalism. According to Teubner, um, this is a communicative process. So we should look at a specific subsystem of society. And what should we look at? What should we try to observe? We should try to observe whether there are normative expectations emerging from that specific subsystem of society. Um, to be clear, what I present here is an analytical scheme that can be useful to observe reality. So it is not normative, it is just an analytical scheme that can then be used to, to test whether we are actually able to observe such a process or not. So that would be the first stage. When normative expectations emerge, I will then talk about later what this internal reflexive process uh, means. Then at the second stage, according to Teutner, there would be a juridification of these normative expectations that emerge from the specific subsystem of society. Uh, in terms of uh, autopoietic uh, system theory, Luhmann's theory, that would be a structural coupling between this specific subsystem and the law, basically uh, a reformulation of normative expectations that come from a specific subsystem in the language um, of the law. Now, the process of, of uh, uh, constitutionalization is not accomplished at this stage. A, a third step is required for that to happen. And that is, uh, according to Teubner, um, an application of legal um, norms on legal norms. Something similar as HLA Hart has suggested when introducing secondary norms and uh, primary norms. So in Hart, secondary norms are norms that deal with the functioning of primary norms. Um, and this is in a way also what constitutional norms do. They deal with norms of a lower hierarchical um, uh, level. So that would be the final stage. Only when we reach this third stage, we can uh, talk about a societal constitutional, uh, constitutional process that has um, been accomplished. Now, that is the theory in a nutshell. Now, theory requires verification. <clears throat> and um, I have looked for getting empirical evidence to test 
and verify this theory in the realm of net neutrality, I have looked at evidence um, from the United States. And um, here are some of the key events of the net neutrality debate in the United States. Now, I'm aware that there are many people here in the room that know this uh, debate very well, much better than I do. So uh, I can be very brief to recall some of the basic stages in this debate. Um, I think the, the term um, net neutrality was coined by Tim Wu in uh, 2003, essentially as a political concept. And as a political concept, it was also first used by the FCC two years later in 2000, 2005 in this internet policy statement. <clears throat> and then the first legal use of the concept happened only in 2008 when the FCC applied the concept in the Comcast case. So it tried to make that concept a legal concept. But the Court of Appeals um, reversed that decision of the FCC in this uh, April 2010 decision, essentially uh, deciding that there was no legal authority of the FCC to do that. So saying this is not a legal concept. We cannot treat it as a legal concept. Now, <clears throat> the FCC backpedaled and introduced a new uh, a proposal for um, uh, kind of net neutrality rules in 2010. But again, the Court of Appeal or for appeals of the DC Circuit uh, reacted and reversed that decision um, of the FCC again, saying um, there was no um, legal authority of the <coughs> FCC. And now, what is very interesting in that in that uh, moment in 2014, basically, um, something happened. There was there were many. Um, there were many civil society uh, organizations, um, internet activists, consumer organization, public uh, policy activists who uh, argued uh, that net neutrality is a very important value that should be protected and that the FCC should really adopt strong and enforceable rules um, on net neutrality. And these uh, groups, they mobilized um, people. And that also then was uh, pressure that, the, um, that influenced the FCC. And the FCC reacted in um, opening a consultation on a new proposal that was uh, uh, taking place in May 2014. And now a broad mobilization um, happened, and that was something that was observed closely by the Media Lab here. And uh, I, I think that is great, um, great uh, research that has been undertaken by the Media Lab, uh, demonstrating uh, um, and uh, also observing very closely how the net reacted on, on the various interventions and, and uh, um, proposals that have been made. But what is fascinating that almost um, 4 million people filed comments on, these, uh, pro on this proposal of the FCC. And many people um, argued that um, actually um, the FCC should reclassify um, should reclassify broadband services um, as telecommunication services because, because before they were classified as uh, internet services and so there was no authority for the FCC to, to uh, really um, to act. And uh, very interestingly, again, the FCC um, responded to these comments and uh, modified uh, their original proposal and ab adopted strong rules um, on 26 February 2015, rules um, that um, provide for a reclassification 
of uh, fixed and mobile broadband services as telecommunication services, so as requested by many um, commenters, and then also um, adopting um, three so-called bright line rules, banning uh, basically uh, the blocking, throttling, and uh, paid prioritization of um, data uh, on the internet, and then there were two more rules that were adopted, the general uh, conduct rule and the general um, transparency rule. Now, uh, clearly, uh, the telecommunications company, the telecom lobby, uh, was not happy with that decision, and um, they um, challenged this decision. Um, of the FCC again with the Court of Appeals. But now, uh, strikingly, this time the Court of Appeals um, said, okay, yes, the legal authority is here, this reclassification is fine, and the rules that were adopted by the FCC, they are in conformity with the law. So um, if, if the story would stop here, one could say, yes, a juridification of the concept um, is accomplished. But unfortunately, the story continues. The telecommunication lobby um, uh, is going to fight against um, these rules on every level. They announce that they go to the Supreme Court. I don't know how far this, uh, pro these proceedings are at the moment. But probably more um, uh, importantly, um, the new presidency changed um, the political situation completely with regard to net neutrality. So the FCC will have an, a new composition and there will be a Republican majority and there will be people in the FCC that are not uh, really friends of net neutrality. So we could say at the moment we are probably um, f far away from uh, a juridification of net neutrality than we were a couple of years um, ago. So now let me use this, um, this uh, data, this empiric evidence to uh, come back to these three elements that I introduced at the beginning. Now the question would be which is the specific subsystem that we have to look at when we want to observe whether there are normative expectations related to the no net neutrality are emerging. I argue in the written version of my paper that we should look at the economic system because in my view many um, debates, many uh, communications related to net neutrality are essentially economic um, um, communications. We could talk about that in the discussion if uh, people are here who disagree. So I think the economic system is the system to look at and um, then we have to look whether there are normative expectations emerging within this system. And now this interplay between the, um, between the organized professional and the spontaneous sphere of the economy are very important. What do I mean? The organized professional sphere is the sphere where you have the corporations, the telecom corporations. And the spontaneous sphere of the economy, this is the, the sphere where you have civil um, society representatives, all the actors that I mentioned before. And these two spheres there are in a way in a reflexive process. So they look on each other, they observe each other, they uh, push each, each other to, to become more precise and to um, uh, develop uh, responses to certain criticism, and that is this reflexive process that um, helps to uh, specify these normative expectations that are emerging. And then the juridification stage, here, the, these normative expectations that emerge from the economic system would be structurally coupled with the legal system, so basically reformulated in the language of the law. And when we try to adapt that to the empiric evidence that I mentioned before, I think here we can observe a kind of um, um, communication or exchange between the internet economy sector in the one hand, in dialogue with the FCC in their legal capacity, because FCC, in my view, is a kind of hybrid uh, organization with political functions and legal functions, so in its legal capacity, and certainly also with the Court of Appeals. But uh, as I said, 
certainly this process of juridification is not uh, accomplished. The story continues. So it is only hypothetical to look also at the third stage. Um, what would we expect uh, or what should we expect um, at this stage? We would expect um, the development of constitutional structures distinguishing in a binary um, code uh, between constitutional and unconstitutional. So essentially the application of legal norms um, on uh, these um, juridified normative expectations that emerge um, from the economic system. So what we, what we ha would have are two um, reflexive processes. One reflexive process in the economic system essentially so between this spontaneous and the organized professional sphere and then another reflexive process within the legal system uh, where basically uh, constitutional distinctions would then be applied and in the case of the United States I could think of the, cons of the Supreme Court of the United States that would finally um, deal with such questions. But I mean, that scheme is not um, only ap applicable to the situations in the United States. It's, I think it uh, has a, a, a universalistic claim. So that is, um, in a way, um, the proof of the pudding, or my suggestion, how the proof of the pudding could look like. Um, now, the final questions that, that I would like you to um, think about with me is a very key question. If there is such a process of societal constitutionalism, how should we understand the relationship between such a development of constitutional norms and the formal processes of constitutional amendment? What would be the re relationship between the societal constitutional process and the formal constitutional process? I think this is a very, very difficult and very important question. So I'm very keen to hear um, your reactions afterwards. My suggestion is the following. When we have um, constitutional amendments, in many states there are... Um, supermajority requirements needed for amending the Constitution. This is certainly the case for the United States and so there the stakes are very high and uh, accordingly uh, constitutional amendments happen very rarely. It is much um, more likely to happen in uh, Switzerland for example where we have um, referendums and the referendum then is brought forward uh, to a, um, a votation of, of the people. And uh, the constitutional amendment is um, adopted when we have a double majority, a majority of the people voting and a major majority uh, of the sub-federal um, political entities, the so-called cantons. Then if the two majorities are there, we have a constitutional amendment. And that happens in Switzerland all the time. Um, beyond these formal procedures of constitutional amendment, what we have is also the change of the constitution by uh, the way of, um, of uh, judges um, deciding and interpreting um, the constitution. Uh, this uh, is observable um, in Switzerland again, it is also observable um, in uh, Germany and also um, in, at certain um, instances it has been observed um, in the uh, case law of the Court of J Justice of the European Union. In Switzerland, for instance, um, the Swiss Federal Court has been recognizing unwritten constitutional rights, unwritten uh, freedoms of the constitution since 1959. Now, a last word on my view how this relationship between um, social constitutionalism and formal constitutionalism should be seen. I don't uh, see those processes in an antagonistic way. I see them more as a kind of interconnected vessels, as um, two um, areas that are in a reflexive relationship. Let me explain what I mean. 
if you have a societal um, constitutionalistic process, a process of societal constitutionalism, um, certainly um, from the perspective of formal, a formal constitution, you can criticize certain shortcomings with regard to um, legitimation and um, acceptance. So that would be the check uh, from the formal constitution on the social constitution. But it works also the other way around. Uh, I think um, from a social uh, constitutionalist perspective, you could also um, uh, criticize or check uh, whether the formal constitutional processes work as they should. It can be the case that uh, actually in certain areas there is uh, an absence of a really living democratic um, functioning of the institutions and there the societal constitutional processes could point to a requirement of reform. So this is uh, very briefly what I wanted to say as an introduction and I'm now very interested to hear your reactions and uh, would like also to uh, hear your ask uh, questions and, and comments. Thank you so much, Christoph. Maybe if you don't mind to switch back to uh, slide seven, uh, which I found very helpful. So if I may kick off the discussion with, with a, a brief question, looking at this bottom layer here and the question of how normative expectations form, particularly in the paper, and but also in your presentation, you highlighted that there is an interactive um, dynamic going on between somehow the organized uh, professionals, uh, you use the telcos, the companies as kind of one example in this mm -hmm. category, and some sort of the less organized, more bottom-up, more uh, distributed civil society participants and policy advocates mm -hmm. and consumer organizations and the like. And I was wondering whether you could say a little bit more about that and maybe also bring in Rob Farris who has done research empirically on this question, looking at the net neutrality debate uh, specifically, as to what extent actually um, the, the crystallization of these normative expectations results from this unorganized versus organized, or as to what extent, um, which is slightly in tension, I believe, to what you said, uh, it very much depends whether these normative expectations crystallize that also the unorganized get organized, right? Um, you made this point in the paper where you said, well, that ultimately the unorganized um, got influential with the FCC required some sort of campaign. So I was just really interested mm. in, are there really two sides at this level, unorganized and organized, or, or is it more a story of becoming organized? So that would be my first question. Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, the term organization is a sociological, essentially a sociological a term that is usually used to describe um, entities that have uh, received a formal organization uh, as, for instance, uh, a corporation has received a formal organization. Uh, the term organized professional is used in that sense. I mean, the spontaneous sphere of the economy, all these civil society um, representatives, all these various dynamics, uh, decentered dynamics, they lack this kind of formal organization that would apply to a corporation. Uh, but you're right, in another way to look at the question of organization, not in this uh, formal sociological sense, it is clear that um, in the debate that has been uh, um, observed um, by um, the Media Lab, it became clear that also um, civil society um, learned how to join forces and how to um, increase their impact in mobilizing uh, uh, people. And, and there, there were many uh, also very creative uh, activities and uh, interventions. John Oliver, for instance, I recall, made a huge difference uh, with, with uh, a broadcast uh, I think uh, in, in England even, uh, about the US debate and that had made a, a huge change in, in the debate and, uh, and uh, was helpful to mobilize um, uh, at the end four million people. So I do not see it as a clear antagonistic uh, distinction, but more I, I think it was a question of terminology. I see, thank you. Rob, is this a good 
point where you can briefly summarize some of the highlights from your empirical study on uh, what has been going on in this debate? I'd, I'd actually rather ask questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, th thank you so much for the presentation. It's fascinating and a lot to actually get one's head around. Um, what what we observed in the net neutrality debate was certainly a division amongst the professional classes as to what the right answer was, and I don't think there was anything in that debate that actually answered those substantive questions about whether net neutrality was a good idea or not. Um, and then we saw the spontaneous organizing, as you describe, um, take place. And that was very lopsided. And, and I guess the, the question that comes out of this for me is, how, how do we know when normative expectations have actually emerged? And, and like, what's the measure of that? And who's actually has the standing to make that measure? And I guess it's that interaction be between the formal political and the spontaneous that kind of leads to those answers. The, the, and the one last thing I want to throw in there, which is uh, you, you rightly point out that four million number. And I think one of the stories untold in the net neutrality debate is the framing around it as to what was a legitimate expression of kind of the normative expectations of society and what wasn't. The first two million um, or so comments to the FCC occurred in the summer. People looked at them at the Sunlight Foundation. They looked at it, and an overwhelming number were pro-net neutrality. I, I don't remember exactly, but it was over 95% of them. There was another round in September that um, the other side of the debate ruled it. And the reason they were able to do that was through an email campaign that a lot of people thought was um, not legitimate. So they were, a lot of people, it was done by a, a social media marketing firm and, and they got a lot of people to sign up and say net neutrality is a very bad example. But that actually got no credence at all. And, and people often cite that four million number suggesting that four million people were in support of net neutrality, but there was actually this, this, uh, this waiting process that went on behind the scenes. Tom Wheeler himself, he cited four million comments hmm. and didn't say that almost half of them were um, anti-net neutrality in yeah. the end, which is funny. <laughs> so these are very f uh, interesting uh, remarks and questions that, that you're bringing up. Um, uh, I think, um, yes, um, this interaction between the organized professional and the spontaneous fear that is actually the process where normative expectations in a way get formed where they where they shape and um, to talk about the FCC and the four million comments it is fascinating to read the report um, or, or this um, decision opinion of the FCC of uh, 2015 where the FCC continuously refers to um, comments coming from uh, people of the civil society. But as you, as you correctly also say, this uh, campaign by, I think, American Commitment, was it? They, they uh, invited people to um, send um, pre-formed uh, or pre-printed um, uh, forms um, expressing uh, a view that was against net neutrality. And I mean, that is exactly the point where I think that this relationship between the formal constitutional procedures and the spontaneous constitutional procedures are important. I think that is exactly a situation where there is a shortcoming regarding legitimacy of uh, expressions that, in, that come from the spontaneous sphere. And here there is a, a necessary check of the question of democratic legitimacy required. So that is very good that you point to this uh, example. Thank you. Thank you. Let's open up. We have a question right here. Uh, following on that question of... Thank you. Uh, following on that question of democratic legitimacy, uh, recently Erica Chenoweth wrote about that uh, civil resistance needs about 3.5% of the population to participate in order for it to How be... How many percent? 3.5%. 
we can quibble on the exact number, I'm sure. Um, but which is very, uh, I, I know a lot of people have been paying attention to given the protests that are going on right now in the country. For this type of norms creation to translate into a legal sphere, you've now, and we've discussed the four million number, do you have a sense of whether it's a percentage or a way to describe the uh, how, how many need to be involved in the process in order for it to gain legitimacy? Or is it possible for this type of a system to be hijacked by a small group? Thank you very much. Um, basically, I don't think that it is a, a quantitative question. It is uh, very difficult really to assess at which stage w we can speak of really normative expectations that have emerged. Probably it is easier to, um, to um, come to, to a, a clear statement uh, in a historic perspective. After a certain event happened, one could then reconstruct and say, yes, that was the stage where really um, a, a, a strong momentum um, was uh, present, but I would not be willing to um, mention any numbers as a kind of threshold for the point where you could talk, start to talk about normative expectations that have emerged from civil society. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm Mary Gray. I'm a fellow here at the Brookman Klein Center. And I'm, I'm realizing when I hear the word spontaneous sphere, I'm thinking of collective action and social movement. And you're a sociologist of, of law. But it's interesting that we, sent, we seem to be approaching this as though it's masses of individuals acting versus there are um, flexible, we could say maybe informal institutions, nonprofits, community-based organizations that are very much part of constituting um, these movements. So I'm just, I think my question is, are there ways to think about this as, as um, intersecting with um, the freedom to assemble, for example, uh, that we tend to think of as just, an, again, kind of faceless uh, masses of individuals that, in, in, at least empirically, when we look at how these things come together, even for those two, two million, it had to do with a lot of collective social action that had, you know, had to kind of corral that energy and also had its form letters. I mean, I sent a form letter. So I don't know that it's terribly different than the two million who said no, that we, we, we might be at a moment where we don't know how to contend with the constituting of those values that's happening through these um, loose networks that are assembling um, and I'm just wondering if there's a, a legal route for bringing this conversation to, to the right to assemble. Yeah, thank you. Um, the freedom of um, assembling, I don't know whether it exists in the US Constitution. In Switzerland, it exists. Um, I think I'm not an expert about the freedom of um, assembling, but uh, I would expect that it has in mind basically um, the people coming uh, together and meet in a way in person, face to face. That possibility to have a, a room where they come and meet and then debate. Because if, if a meeting is not taking place, I think you could talk about free speech or freedom of communication and exp uh, information, uh, expression and information as the, the term is in, in, in Europe. You would not need to refer to, um, to the freedom of, of uh, assembling. But surely communication between these um, um, distributed um, smaller groups um, is extremely important because then these smaller groups, they have the possibility to mobilize uh, people who sympathize with their um, agendas and then they need to join forces and, and that is extremely important for such uh, a mobilization, a broad mobilization um, is uh, being possible as it was in the case of, of net neutrality. If, if I may jump in here with a quick follow-up question. Um, are you nervous about that development or what we just described as a phenomenon? Because to me, when listening and also looking what's happening politically right now, 
isn't there a certain randomness to the quality that, that you describe here that, yes, sometimes you know, there may be a tipping point and something crystallizes that then bubbles up and then, okay, there is some sort of a filter mechanism which is heavily shaped by the political preferences of the filtering, the people in control of the filtering mechanism, as you alluded to. Uh, but then there may be instances where you have really important social norms that emerge here uh, that somehow don't find the constituency where this, this, this sort of collective action uh, moment happens and comes together and therefore uh, doesn't even get a chance to bubble up. Is that mm. something we, we should be concerned about, about this kind of, some sort of randomness behind this? I think it's a question from which perspective th that you approach the issue. Um, if you st um, start with the um, um, situation that is familiar and which is in a way what most jurists um, understand as the classic situation is that constitutional amendments um, happen according to um, prescribed rules uh, which uh, make sure that uh, democratic uh, legitimation is assured when the constitution is changed because the constitution is considered to be the, the most uh, authoritative and important uh, document of uh, any uh, nation state. So uh, if, if you look at just this situation, I would say in such a situation, it is very, very difficult for certain um, values to emerge and to make it into the constitution, especially if you consider that the constitution was drafted at a certain moment, at the moment uh, in uh, the United States and also in Switzerland, where we have a reformed constitution of 2000, where the internet had not uh, this uh, strong position as it has at the moment in the United States it was far away. So, um, and there are certain um, jurists, certain um, lawyers uh, in Switzerland and also elsewhere, which uh, interpret the constitution in a rather conservative way, saying um, no change is possible and we have to interpret it by the letter. So if this is, let's say, the normal situation, I would say this kind of process, societal constitutional process can be a kind of uh, um, uh, element which would open up this, this, uh, this uh, more uh, petrified uh, way of, of uh, reflecting uh, social needs in the, uh, uh, in the institutions of, of a state. Great. Niva? So this is a quick follow-up on uh, Ori's uh, question, I think in the same direction. So if we think about uh, formal constitutions, they actually reflect our fundamental social contract and the main function would be to protect us against capture by temporary majority, right? And the process that you have been describing to us is a process where actually power could prevail, right? I mean, this is like you warn us against, you know, the reoccurrence of power, you know, as we will see, we'll hear more even in the net neutrality um, um, uh, context. And my question is whether when you, so you described, uh, this is a descriptive model, right? And the question is whether when we look at it from a normative perspective, is there any way to insert some safeguards into this process to secure against this type of abuse of power so that you know, those in power at a certain time would be able to compromise our social contract? Yeah, that is a very uh, important question, and I uh, understand why both of you are concerned in this respect. Um, you know, probably it is because I, um, coming from Switzerland, and I have confidence in uh, direct democratic um, institutions, <laughs> that, uh, that I am uh, less less uh, scared uh, um, about um, the... Um so you're saying I've been in the US for too long that I start to worry about this. 
No, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, certainly you cannot compare Switzerland with the United States. But I think. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, Hannah Arendt, for instance, um, she was very um, concerned um, with the situation after the Second World War. And she, um, uh, she had a, a strong emphasis in uh, uh, making ideas of direct democracy strong. So she fought uh, all her life um, for more direct democratic elements. And I mean, you can, uh, if, if the people have all the time the possibility to express their views and are included in political uh, processes, then these people also learn how to make a responsible use of their political rights. And certainly, in also in such a situation where you have more, um, let's say, bottom-up influences making it into the uh, formal institutions, there is clearly also a need for checks. And um, at this stage of juridification, there is a first important check, because here, um, these self-founded normative expectations they um, are checked by um, institutions, as we have seen in the case of uh, net neutrality in the United States. The uh, Court of Appeals of the um, DC Circuit is one of the institutions then, which then have this uh, possibility to check on the normative expectations that emerge. And also at the third stage, then actually this debate would then, uh, let's say, enter also the constitutional debate and it might be that then such a question is brought before the, court of su the Supreme Court of the United States if we talk about the United States and the Supreme Court would then have to decide how to see such um, a new emerging norm uh, on the basis of the existing rules that um, are in the formal document of the United States and also in the case law that has uh, emerged from, from that. So I share your concern but I'm more confident with um, the possibilities uh, to have checks on such dangerous developments. Thank you. So I'm from Denmark, uh, an even more trustful uh, country, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed your talk, and, and especially the way you, um, you use Luhmann um, for your framework. But I'm, I, haven't, I, I must say I haven't read your paper, so maybe my question is, is off uh, for that reason, but my sense from following the net neutrality uh, debate, mainly in Europe and mainly from a human rights perspective, is that the emergence of normative expectations actually didn't ar ar arise within the economic system, but from outside the economic system. And then eventually, those expectations annoyed or irritated the economic system to an extent where they had to, to take them in and deal with them. So, I mean, I'm a bit surprised that you say the normative expectations for net neutrality came from within the economic system. My, my reading of it is that the economic system kept opposing precisely those values. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I, I expected this question um, some time ago, and I'm very grateful that you finally uh, asked it. Um, I had... Um, debates, discussions with Gunter Teutner about the question, which I, I uh, sent him this, this paper and we discussed it and we disagreed on the question which um, system would be the, the subsystem at issue. Teutner argues that there is um, a system um, like the internet. Internet is also a system for Teutner. And I um, disagree with him on that. Um, I had really to think uh, twice or even three times to, to develop my uh, argument against him because he is really a very strong thinker. But my arguments essentially um, are based on a classical reading of Luhmann's theory. So Luhmann's theory, um, I, don't ho I hope that I will not bore you with too much details about that, is a communication theory. And there are classic communication systems that have been described by Luhmann, let's say politics, the law, economics, science, uh, religion, education, health, art. 
um, family. So these are some of the main systems that have been described. So if you look at a specific subsystems where normative expectations would happen, you should, if you apply Luhmann, um, then you should look at one of these systems. Now Teubner goes beyond Luhmann and says the internet should also be considered as a system. And I disagree with him because in my view, in my view I should talk then more about that, um, this internet realm it is about communication, but it is not itself communication. It is a technical means that can be used for people to communicate. It is a kind of infrastructure. And it is not itself a social system. So that is a short answer to your question, which would require a lot more um, debate. But I don't think that uh, most people here would be interested in that. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk and the paper. I wanted to ask one question, methodological, conceptual, about the constitution. When would you say we could say that the formal constitutionalization has happened? Because if, if Supreme Court upholds FCC's rules, it does that not yet mean that, right? It only means that FCC's rules are not unconstitutional, but it doesn't say that there is a positive obligation. And, and connected with that, why do you think we should go through the constitution to assure that? Because a descriptive claim net is neutral, so the practice and technology is such that it's neutral, and it comes from normative expectations, it doesn't have to be descriptive of the Constitution. The easiest way to do it would be to pass an act of the Parliament. So do, do, do we really need to have that as a constitutional principle to have the neutral net? And on the last thing, what we, we, which came about the democratic um, part, so I come from Poland, have strong ties to Germany, uh, to Hungary, so my belief in direct democracy and democracy has been shaken lately. And when you refer to Arendt, I was wondering that the, the rights in the constitution and German constitution was not actually social contract of the German people, it was written and given to them by the Americans, are supposed to be neutral and obvious regardless of the, of the democratic majority. And with what we can see around the world now, wouldn't you say that in a way, even if there is no emergence from the societal constitution. There are some things, and net neutrality should be one of them, where the court should rule anyhow. There are many questions. Let me feel free to pick one. Yeah. Uh, time safe. Let me ask the first question. So you're asking, uh, at which stage uh, could we then say that um, this uh, third stage has um, been accomplished? Would it be sufficient? that a court like the Supreme Court would say it is not unconstitutional. No, that would not be sufficient. It would require that a court, a constitutional court, be it the American court or another court or another type of, of institution would say this is a new constitutional right. So uh, compared to the S Swiss federal court who said, for instance, in um, the 1960s, that um, freedom of expression and information is now an unwritten right of the Swiss constitution because in parenthesis before that it didn't exist in the Swiss constitution in the written text but the Swiss federal court recognized it as an unwritten constitutional right and that it had the effect that it had the same standing as the written constitutional rights that were to be found in the document so that was the first question. And um, do we need a constitutional right to protect net neutrality? That is a key question of the research I'm conducting here over the next couple of months. I uh, insist, and I think it is really very, very uh, important that this uh, communication that we have on the internet is considered to be as something that is not um, protected already by the existing constitutional rights like uh, free speech um, or freedom of uh, expression and information if you look at European context. I think that the communication that is taking place on the internet is something specific and that uh, is so important 
that it is, in a way, the essence for all professional or private communication for most people worldwide. And I think that communication process needs to be protected, not only in the sense that individuals are protected in that communication, but also that the internet itself is protected as an institution, that not private powers can control that institution and, for instance, uh, Facebook in India um, introduced f free basics in a way um, to argue, yes, we bring now the internet to the people, but having a hidden agenda behind and wanting to extend power uh, on these basic institutions. So I think it is really necessary that we have a, a new constitutional right. What a powerful way to end this uh, launch your own presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it was great uh, having you here. Thank you.